Hey guys, welcome back to the Dev Marketer channel. All right, so in this video, what we're gonna be focusing on is actually just kind of following up with our previous video about the Laravel WebSocket server. We did all the configuration and setup in that last video so we could start playing with our server and um, you know using WebSockets and everything like that. And like I said in that video, it just basically runs out of the box. It's really easy to set up. Of course, one of the great things about this package is that it is fully customizable. And what we're gonna do in this video is just go through the customization settings, um, kind of just go down the page and explain them in more detail. So if you do wanna customize or configure the application or the server, um, you can do it with just going through these settings. So let's just dive into it. We'll keep it short, it won't waste too much of your time. And um, hopefully this can just help you guys set it up uh, the way that you want it. All right, now all I'm gonna do here, we actually still have it running, but I'm just gonna jump over to our terminal, or not our terminal, to our command line and just open up all the configuration settings are gonna be located in the config WebSockets folder, okay? So the config WebSockets folder, and um, that's where all the settings that we need to do are here, are inside of here. Now we talked quite a bit about apps. So if you do, um, this does allow you to have multi-tenancy, so you can have, um, give each of your apps different API and secret keys um, so that you can define who they are and they're not sharing their own keys. And this is really good if you have a project that has um, tons of different clients. Like for example, you've got like mobile devices, maybe an iOS app, you've got an Android app, you've got um, an internet of things device maybe or something. Um, and then of course, different websites and stuff like that. You can give each of them, set them each up as different apps so that they can, um, they have their own logins and uh, credentials and stuff like that. So that's a really good feature. And as I mentioned, you can just um, set these up by just copying this pasting it and then you know just duplicating this however many times you want with their own credentials. Of course, if you make sure you do the second one, just remember to change, you're probably not gonna wanna pull all of them from the ENV file, um, or you maybe you do, but just set it up like on app two or something. So all of these are like app two name, app two um, key or something like that, whatever you want, okay? And that's basically how you configure that. Um, okay, so that's the apps. We talked about that quite a bit in the last video. Now let's just scroll down and see what some of these other settings are. So there is the app provider. This is the app provider that defines what um, uh, what apps there are. So if you did want to create a more advanced like interface, um, like in the back end or something, where users could basically set up their own keys and app credentials and stuff like that, um, you would need to override this app provider class. Um, I'm not going to go into that. That's a pretty you know um, niche use case, but it is possible there. You can define that here. Just change it to your service provider that overrides this um, config app provider and you can do whatever you want. All right, that's pretty cool. Next, we've got allowed origins. So by default, um, this our web server is going to accept connections from anybody, anyone out on the internet. So um, if you do not, if you don't want to, if you want to restrict access, which I recommend doing, if you're pushing this to production, you're not going to want basically anyone in their dog to be able to access or log into your WebSocket server. Um, and so you can define which origins are allowed access. So just, you've got an array here. You can just put in each, um, each origin, um, allowed origin in here, just comma separate it, and you can define different, um, uh, different allowed, you know, uh, and you can define who is allowed access to it. And that will just, it's like a nice little basic firewall to restrict access to certain users. Next, if you come down, you can see our request size in kilobytes. This just defines the maximum payload size for our, um, for our web sockets. So when they, they pass a payload in the body and um, you can just define the max size that, that is, this is set to 250 kilobytes by, um, by default. That's a quarter of a megabyte, which is quite a big, considering it's, it's a JSON object, that's one hell of a big JSON object. You can fit a lot of data in there. Just for comparison, um, pushers, um, you, obviously we're comparing pusher quite a bit here, but pusher allows you 10 kilobytes of uh, payload per per request, okay? So you're restricted down to 10 kilobytes, and usually that's not a problem for most people. 10 kilobytes is decent. Um, yeah, it's a fair amount for JSON. I mean, that's a good amount. Um, but you can sometimes hit that limit. This allows you to go basically as big as you want, um, and again, the default is 250. You might actually wanna bring that down, to be completely honest, um, but it's up to you, so the default's there. Next, you have your path. This allows you to define the path for that, um, uh, for the the dashboard that we experienced. So I said the default was Laravel dash WebSockets, and you can see that here. If you just wanted to be WebSockets, you can change that. That's what I usually have done when I've used this package in my personal projects. Okay. 
All right, now next we see our middleware. This just allows you to define middleware for this, um, for the dashboard class. Um, so if someone does go up to access the dashboard, you're gonna wanna define middleware for who is allowed. So um, you can create middleware, obviously, create middleware or use a you know a built-in middleware. Um, I would recommend making like a gate. So you can make a gate that allows you to view the WebSockets dashboard and you give certain users access to that gate. I'm not gonna go, I don't, it doesn't really make sense to go into that. Just set, you know, configure users as you normally would with using the built-in Laravel authentication gates. Um, that's one way to do it. You can do it anyway. I mean, you could manually allow people in your middleware and then put that middleware in here. So just to find an array of all the middlewares that you want um, inside of here to restrict access to your um, dashboard. That only affects your dashboard. So any user has access to the, um, to you know, connect. Well, I mean, based on your channel, if you have a private channel, then obviously you authenticate those individually. But I mean, this doesn't restrict um, connecting to clients and stuff like that. If you want, um, this is only for accessing the dashboard. If you want to restrict access um, to actually, you know, connect to the server, um, you would want to change that up here under allowed origins. And if you want to restrict access to a channel, then you want to change that inside of your on a you know on a per channel basis inside of routes and channels okay so this is only for the dashboard next we have statistics okay so with statistics the way statistics work in laravel is you have a mysql database it's one database table that records all of your statistics now by default it is going to record three po data points really four data points i guess it records your app id for the app because you have multiple app ids so you can see how each app id is being used individually. So it records the app ID, it records the um, the number of incoming API requests, the number of outgoing uh, WebSocket messages, and the number of concurrent um, connections, uh, people connected to WebSockets, um, or just total connections, not necessarily people, because people might be connected to multiple WebSockets. Uh, but the number of total connections, okay? So um, it records those, um, those four data points, and each one of those is gonna take up one row in your MySQL database. So you can define how frequently it records those. It's kind of the resolution of that data, um, how deeply, how fine-grained you wanna go, or if you don't need as much data, you can save space in your database and so forth. So um, of course, the model that defines that is assigned here, so if you wanted to extend that, you could. If you wanted to record other pieces of information, you could just extend this, um, extend this model here and add to, your, to it yourself and then put, of course, put in your new model in this location. Now, um, the next is intervals and seconds. This records that resolution that I was talking about. So by default, it records once a minute. So it's gonna calculate the total number of connections during that minute. It's gonna record the total number of, you know, incoming outgoing messages during that minute. And then it's gonna save that as a record in your database. And it, re it represents one minute in time, okay? Now, one minute later, it's gonna record another row in your database that represents the data for that point in time, okay? So that's what this is defining, is basically like each row in the database, each data point that we, we collect add everything up and save it, how frequently do you wanna do that? In this case, it's every 60 seconds, one minute. You can change this as you wanted. If you wanted more fine-grained detail, you can change it to five seconds. I probably wouldn't do that, that's pretty frequent, but you could. Um, but 60 seconds is a good sensible default. You can also change it, like what I've done in the past, honestly, is five minutes. So you just change it like this, 60 times five. That'll give you five minute intervals. Um, so then each chunk represents five minutes. Um, that just cuts down, you know, by 20, by 80% the number of records you have in this database. Personally, I don't go through this very often. Uh, usually, if I have to look at that um, that dashboard, I'm usually looking at it like for that day a lot of times. I'm not usually looking at it like for very long ago. Um, and I usually don't know, like per minute sometimes is almost too granular for me. Um, I'd rather usually like look back and see like five minute chunks. That's usually more important to me. That's just me personally though. Um, if you want more fine grained detail, you go for it. Next, you can see here, delete statistics older than X days. Um, by default, it's 60 days, two months. That means that um, this actually doesn't work out of the box. The way this works is you have this clean command. So you do run PHP artisan websockets colon clean, and that is going to when you run that command, it's gonna go look in your um, in your statistics database and it's gonna find any records that are over this many days old and it's gonna delete them as just one big batch, all right? So what you wanna do, what you're defining here is basically when that script is ran, um, how you know which record should it delete? It, it's gonna delete any that are more than 60 days old, okay? So what I recommend doing is if you do run this into production is you're gonna to wanna to take this 
clean command, this artisan websockets clean command, you're gonna wanna set that as up, up as a job and have it run like every night at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., something like that, and just have it clean out your database once a night. And that's basically gonna take, it's gonna look at the anything that's more than 60 days old and delete it. The next morning it'll delete it. So you'll basically always have 60 days of data retention in here. And of course you can change it here. Um, what I usually do is 30. So you saw here, I usually do 60 times five and I usually do 30 here. That's just what I do. I've never wished, like I've never regretted this, like wishing I had you know, two months or three months worth of uh, WebSocket data. I've never needed to go back and check it. You know what I mean? Like if you have a problem, you're gonna have it right away. I've never like wished I could go back and look at a precise minute, you know, two months ago or three months ago. So for me, I just set it lower and then I don't have as much um, activity in my database. Just keep in mind if you set this to like 60 and this is at 60, these are the defaults. Uh, let's pull up a calculator here real quick. So we pull up a calculator here just to kind of demonstrate, it's gonna create one record every 60 seconds. That's one minute, all right? And it's going to do that 24 hours a day for 60 days. So that means if you have 60 days times 24 hours in a day times 60 minutes in an hour, means you have 86,400 records. So you're gonna have 86,400 records in your database just storing WebSocket analytics. Just, I mean, that just depends on whether it's worth it for you. Um, this, you know, eats into a little bit of your memory and your CPU processing and stuff like that. Just gonna eat into the performance a little bit. Again, it just depends on your needs. If this is, you know, if this is an application that's making you, you know, 20, 30, you know, $100,000 a month, that's definitely probably worth it. I would go ahead and just do that. It's probably maybe even do 90 days in that case. If this is just a small side project, you wanna run it on very low hardware and stuff like that, maybe just cut back. You may not really need to worry about it. So um, that's 86,400 records. And then it's usually gonna go one more day. So it's usually gonna go to like 61 days and then you'll purge the last day. So that means you've got another, um, 60 times 24. So you're at 87,840. You know, so you're at almost 88,000 records and then you'll delete it, go back to 86, 88, 86, and you'll kind of do that throughout the, that's basically what's gonna happen. So it just depends on whether that's worth it. I just wanna show you those numbers so you, um, just to kind of keep in mind how it works. Instead, the way I've usually done it is again, I usually do 60 times five and I usually do uh, 30 days. And that gives you 30 days of data retention, which is usually pretty good. Um, I've never really regretted that, like I said. So if you do this, you've got, um, let's see, we've got 60 times five, that's 300. So there's, um, we're recording 300 records a day, and then we've got 30 days. So we've got 9,000 records. So we go from 9,000 or 88,000 records almost down to 9,000 records, okay? And then you'll, you know, you'll get 93, 9,300 basically and then you'll delete it that night, 90, and you'll kind of just do that. That's a lot more sensible to me. Just me, that's just me personally. There's nothing right or wrong. And again, it depends on your, if I was working with a company that was doing like serious revenue and you really wanted to retain that data, I would change that. I would definitely, it's worth going much more detailed. I would do even 30 seconds maybe, and you know, 90 days of retention, it would be worth it. So it really just depends on your use case. All right, and then the last thing here is to perform, uh, perform DNS lookup. By default, this is false. If your WebSocket server and your Laravel servers are on the same uh, same server, then you can just leave this set to false. Um, however, if they're on separate servers, then they're going to need to do a DNS lookup um, in order to identify what, in order for um, uh, the the WebSocket server to identify who it is and attribute uh, statistics to the right place. So you're going to want to perform that DNS lookup if they're on separate servers. So just put in a DNS resolver inside of here and in, in an IP address. So I would recommend, um, uh, I would honestly just do 1.1.1.1. That is Cloudflare's, um, uh, Cloudflare's privacy DNS. That's the best DNS. That's what I use for all of my stuff. But you can also use like 8.8.8.8 .8 if you want to feed your information to Google. Um, 8.8.4.4 is also Google. So uh, any of those, Cloudflare or Google's, are both, those are the biggest DNS resolvers and they are all, they have edge locations all around the world. So they'll work globally really quickly and stuff like that. So um, you can just change that to your DNS resolver of choice. It doesn't really matter. That's what, just what it's gonna ping. I recommend doing Cloudflare's uh, privacy DNS, uh, which is this one, 1.1.1.1. And um, next we've just got SSL and that's basically it. 
So this is where you define your your uh, your obviously security certificate. Um, you're just going to be basically putting in the actual location of the file. So for each of these, so you've got your certificate file, um, and then you've got your private key, and then uh, your passphrase for your local cert. And um, that's it. So you can just define those here. Um, pretty easy. That's how you'll set up SSL uh, for your project. And then next, you've just got your channel manager. Um, this is just um, how channel persistence is handled. So again, you probably don't really need to change this, but you could extend this if needed. And that's it. That's how you can customize your project. For most of you guys, you're probably just gonna wanna focus on probably a, your allowed origins, especially if you just have one other server that you're connecting to, you probably just set that server as the one origin that's allowed. Um, just for It just helps in, improve your security. It doesn't hurt you. And then um, you may wanna change the path. And then um, if you want that dashboard in production, then you'll wanna change the, the middleware as well. Um, you'll wanna do that. Um, by default, this will not allow you, you can access the middleware up here if you're interested in seeing what it is. By default, it won't, um, that dashboard's not gonna work in production, so it only works on local. So if you wanna change that, then you're gonna to wanna to get rid of this authorized class and put your own um, middleware in there to allow you to do that. So just define who's allowed in there and then um, put that, create a middleware that defines who's in there and then go ahead and import it and use it into this uh, project and add it right here. And that will restrict it down and allow you to access the dashboard on production. Um, and then of course your statistic settings like I mentioned. So that's really what most of you guys are gonna do. And with that, you should be able to configure and set up your uh, Laravel WebSocket server. All right, so that's everything I got for you guys today. Hopefully that was interesting. Again, I didn't wanna throw this into the other video. Um, this was kind of just for people that wanted to specialize and focus on this project a little more and customizing it. So hopefully you guys got some value out of that. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. Again, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'm gonna see you guys in the next video.